Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. What an honor it is for me to walk you through the conversation we're going to have through this course. It's about understanding the environment, the environmental crisis we're currently having, the shift from linear to circular, but fundamentally the ethical compass required for us to navigate turbulent times. But before we go deeper into the conversation, I'd like to tell you more about myself. My name is Mark Esposito. I grew up in North America, namely in Montreal, and later on I moved to the United States. I am currently a, an academic working across multiple disciplines. I worked at Harvard since 2011. I was very blessed to be welcomed in one of the universities that largely is shaping the narrative on so many different sides, including in my case, social science. And more than that, I'd love to tell you more about what I've done with uh, this year of my career. I started in uh, 2016 to get closer in the conversation around the environment. I joined the University of Cambridge, where I co-founded the Circle Economy Research Center. That's the very beginning of my understanding as an economist of the implication on the environment, as we have to discuss together in this course. Now, during the period of time at Cambridge, I realized that the attention and the advocacy was rising, but not necessarily the right level of attention. And so more and more, we started with my colleagues to work. And so from different kinds of publications, books, articles, and all of that, we got closer into the uh, consulting with organizations and governments to try to shape the contest for transformation. Today, we are actually living moments of test. We're testing the very essence of who we are and what we are really standing for. Now, we also find ourselves at the intersection of two profound narratives, and this is something that I have learned at, uh, actually across my career. The first narrative is the fact that we find climate change fundamentally challenging our existence. It threatens the foundation of our life. The other one is that, do we have the moral compass to guide us through what is really the relationship with the natural world? In this course, we'll try to tap on this. Now that we made some acquaintances, what about the introduction to the course? Well, this course, Environmental Ethics, is an exploration of the moral and philosophical dimensions that we need to take into account when we are trying to establish a relationship with the environment. Now, I will also tell you more about the conversation on the climate change, but it's important that we consider climate change not just as a natural environment problem, but also a societal problem because the implications we are about to explore are daunting and they're quite dire. Now let's try to understand much more about this and, and why did I decide to bring this course to your attention. So remember in my introduction, I told you I uh, originally hailed from economics. So why would an economist tell you more about the climate and environmental ethics? As I was mentioning, I was getting deeper and deeper into the conversation on circular economy. I realize that a lot of the foundation of economic theory are largely based on the assumption that the environment is a given, that we can fundamentally work with the environment without considering the externality that we generate. But today we are dealing with an entirely different kind of issue. Why is this so important to consider? Well, let's try to understand, first of all, what is climate change and why do we need to talk about it? Why do we need to dedicate a significant part of this course to the conversation? For many, many years, decades, I would say, there's been skepticism about is the climate changing by itself, the natural evolution of the climate. It's also what scientists call the entropy of the climate. Are we responsible for the transformation on climate? Now, today, I think there is significant scientific evidence the human have interfere with the evolution of our climate. Now, let's be clear, climate is a dynamic and tropic system. It is designed to transform. We sometimes feel uncomfortable with the idea of climate change because it's uncomfortable for us as societies to really undergo the pressure of a change in system. But today, as I mentioned before, rigorous scientific research is really helping us to understand that we are in a specific critical point in our history. In a point in which, if we're not able to understand the implication, the human geography, what it's really like to live with a climate that is fundamentally changing the chemistry, we'll find ourselves dealing with the much deeper repercussions and the cost we might actually endure might be larger than what we can afford. 
Now, we have to understand that this awakening and some form of advocacy is now very, very vivid. In my lifetime, there's never been a time in history more vivid than now for us to understand why climate is so important. But the conversation on climate change is not free of controversies. We have to consider that there is also a political ideology in many parts of the world that sees climate change as a hoax, as man-made, as a political movement, as a movement that is supporting vested interests. So how do we navigate the truth in the academic spectrum? We're not fundamentally intrigued by raising questions that can actually pursue truth. We're not necessarily here to support ideology, although I have to be very honest. There's no economic theory that does not really resemble a political ideology. And this is something that we'll have to navigate this deal, walk the subtle line together. Now, more and more, uh, as I talk about this awakening, we need to consider what are really the considerations ahead of us from an ethical perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, I like to tell you my version of things. And as a scientist, I like to base it on what I believe is a quite unequivocal evidence-based approach, the climate is becoming a threat to our existence. Now, it is not only the long-term implication of the Earth climate changing, but it's also the fact that our human activities have been largely forecasted, based, and designed on the assumption that the climate is cyclical. I remember growing up in North America that we used to have seasons. I'm sure wherever you are in the world, you might have different versions. Some of you living near the equator, maybe you have only one season. Some of you living near the tropics, maybe you have a much more humid and warm season. Some of you living in the northern hemisphere might find it actually just two seasons. Whatever is the narrative, we all knew there are cycles. There are cycles that are following the calendar years, their cycle, they're following what we consider to be the agricultural cycle of crops. And so let me tell you my story. So at least I have a starting point. When I grew up, we started to really think about the fact that there was fall, there was spring, there was summer, and there was, of course, winter. Now, in a different order, so to say, but we were used to that. Uh, I remember when I was in Montreal, uh, we were used to have a lot of months snow on the ground, but later the spring came, and then suddenly we could see this the impact in the vegetation and the blossoming. And then agriculture was following the idea of seasonal fruits. And then we were all looking forward to rally short but warm summers. So July and August were we used to consider the time where summer was coming until basically getting a bit more cooler, the fall was coming. The cycle was actually something we knew. And so from agriculture to our societal norms, the fact that today we have something called daylight saving in some country, where we think about changing the time just because we're closer to the sun, uh, exposure for longer. All of this defines that for a long period of time, we got fundamentally used to the expectation that the climate is cyclical. Now, what if now the climate is fundamentally no longer cyclical? And this is something we need to consider. What is currently threatening the climate are a number of different causes that we can consider to be human-made. Now, I'm sure you heard about greenhouse gas emissions. Fundamentally, it's the major driver of the contemporary climate change narrative. This is also called GHG. This is when fundamentally we have in the emission in the atmosphere of a larger number than what the atmosphere can absorb. I'm sure you heard for many years the idea about the ozone layer, uh, you heard about the fact that some cities around the world are becoming very polluted. So how do we navigate all of this? Well, the idea of, of greenhouse is a fundamental problem we have because fossil fuels economic models are something that belongs to the past. We initiated this, especially after the end of World War II, with the initiation of mass consumption. Today, uh, traditional gas emissions are becoming problematic because Bear in mind that in the 1950s, the population was 2 billion. Today, we are exceeding 8 billion and growing. We're expecting by 2050 to likely plateau to roughly 10 billion people in the world. Now, as a matter of fact, we have been using our land to our own purposes. So we have been deforestating more and more. 
Deforestation fundamentally means cutting down trees, reducing the size of the forest. I'm sure you heard about the Amazon becoming smaller. And I'm sure you also heard that the Amazon is the lungs of the world. In many parts of the world, we see much more cement and built uh, reality than natural environments. That likely changes the balance between emissions and natural oxygen that we have. Like I said before, uh, agriculture is a conversation that we had already mentioned in my story when I was growing up in Canada. Well, agriculture is under enormous amount of pressure. Fundamentally, what we see right now is that from livestock to farming to crops, the entire process of agriculture is generating impact on climate. And our production, how we manufacture, how we are building our cities, all of this is impacting largely the way we are living our life. But the industrial processes are equally responsible for an increasing impact on the climate change. As we are changing the use of land, we're fundamentally changing urbanization. And so today, more than ever, we see that we live in cities. Urbanization today is a vast phenomenon. People decide to live in cities because cities are a conundrum of eventually economic opportunity and, of course, social stability. Uh, not always easy to integrate within social construct, but fundamentally cities are where we tend to live uh, our life. Now, all of this, of course, is creating even more challenges. Rising temperature, I'm sure you heard, that are always hitting new records. Uh, every single year, in the last few years, actually in a row, we see that the temperature becoming warmer. Now, you have to bear in mind that rising temperatures are not only problematic for everything we said before, but they are fundamentally a threat to our uh, food supply. And this is something that we'll talk about more throughout the course as we understand uh, the implication we have with this. And also glacier, melting ice. More and more we're noticing that because the temperature are, are rising, uh, both from the satellite coverage we have in, then what we basically is the study of the earth. We realize uh, mainly through smart imaging that the ice is melting and of course is reducing the size of glacier, mainly in the poles. Now when this happens, as a matter of fact, ice gets melted into the water and the water uh, rises are becoming a challenge for some of the livelihood that have been built over the last few centuries. So when you're hearing stories of cities that might go underwater because of flooded, uh, that's not just a story. We now have a significant evidence that demonstrates that some of the larger mega cities in the world are at risk of flooding. Some of them are even at risk of disappearing. So all of this to give you a sense, and I don't want to feel that I, I'm building unnecessary urgency, but I want you to start feeling more and more that this is a serious conversation we need to understand. So what is that we can summarize? Climate is changing because sea level rise as the ice uh, melts and of course the sea water is expanding. Imagine the implication on the marine biodiversity. Imagine the implication we have it on cities and the idea of floods. But imagine the implication we have on the infrastructure of cities. So this is an important part that we need to keep on taking into account. We have changing weather patterns Remember, the weather was a forecasted mechanism for us to know what to do, and it was about rethinking the seasonal distribution of our activities. When we start having changing weather patterns, we fundamentally are going to change the input on what I mentioned before, the human geography. We have the acidification of the ocean, which basically means as more CO2 is actually infused into the ocean, we're impacting marine life. And bear in mind that fisheries are an important source of, uh, of survival for many of us. I'm sure you also heard how the, the oceans are suffering. We're losing uh, marine life by diversity. We're losing corals. And many of the fishes that we actually are using for human consumption 
they suffer from plastic pollution and of course uh, a larger number of pollutants that we can find in their, uh, in their bodies. When we also see the shrinking of the Arctic sea ice, we have to imagine that not only the climate is changing, but our geography will equally change with that. When we see this happening, there is reason for us to be fundamentally worried. Now, there are other factors that I would like you to take into account. Energy production, we are heavily dependent on energy to run our civilizations. I have to say, thanks to oil and gas, when it was fundamentally introduced, we empower and empower many millions of people to have access to a life of decency. Imagine what we can do today with power. It's an incredible source for good. But it's also true that the way we're going to produce energy is coming at the cost to some extent larger than what the Earth is capable of to absorb. So we will introduce more in the conversation the idea of overshooting the planetary boundaries. And so energy production is an incredible problem that we need to solve. One, because we need energy, but we can't be dependent fundamentally on fossil fuels. Now, the other implication we have on human activities and climate change will be transportation. Imagine how many times you've been very comfortable in driving your car. We don't even think too much about the footprint it generates. I travel extensively for work. Sometimes I get still wondered uh, how magical it is to take a flight that connects people across the continent. But am I really aware of the environmental cost that flying really has? Now, if we didn't have a problem with the environment, that would be just magical. But now we have to consider whether our lifestyles, especially the mobility of over 2 billion people every single year right, in the world, is something we can afford. Back in the conversation on industrial processes, are we producing as we should, or should we consider something very different? Conversation on agriculture that we mentioned, and the food supply, and the use of land. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you can understand that the level of ramification we're talking about is deep, and it's going to go even deeper. You want some examples? Imagine consumers' choices, how we will basically change the way we consume. Imagine the waste generation, how we'll fundamentally use waste. In many parts of the world, waste today is largely tackled in the right way. In countries like South Korea, there is a clear culture on trying to reduce waste. In countries like Saudi Arabia, there is the rise of new cities like Neom and the Line that are designing a zero-waste realities. In many relatively small-sized European cities, waste is largely being reintegrated back into some form of value. In the Nordics, so taking, uh, for example, countries like Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Denmark, we're equally talking about waste becoming energy. But in other parts of the world, the not the same can be said. There are many parts of the world that do not really have a proper policy for waste. Therefore, waste is becoming some form of toxics, uh, or actually you can think some form of poison, right? That is going into the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink. Consumer goods, they will be impacted by this. Imagine today what it is like to have a global trade that is feeding millions of people with different kinds of goods around the world. We all enjoy going to a shop and buy what we want, but sometimes we ask the question, where is this coming from? And the answer might be, I don't know. Well, we cannot really afford this anymore. So the traceability in consumer goods has to be in place for us to be able to understand the implication of climate also in the procurement of stuff. And textile industry is still responsible for the economic survival of many countries. For example, uh, Southeast Asia is largely dependent on that. It's going to be impacted by this because the moment that we're impacting agriculture, think of cotton, for example, we're impacting garments, we're impacting logistics, we're impacting any form of distribution. We will see that the reliance on uh, awareness on the uh, emissions will change fundamentally the industry. Now, I'd like to get you a little bit closer into the conversation. Are we fundamentally impacted by the environment? We are. In a moment, I will try to tell you more about it.